Um, we have Jimmy Rader. He's going to be talking about auto autonomous ground magnetometer station using DRV 425 floodgates. Which one are we using? This one. Okay. Yep. And I'm supposed to look into the camera, right? <laughs> OK, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, this is the first time I'm at a meeting like this. I'm actually not a ham radio operator. I'm a scientist uh, uh, at the University of New Hampshire. And my real business has even nothing to do, I mean, really with uh, magnetometers and stuff. I'm actually a modeler. So you all saw that. Uh, uh, schematic that Jonathan Tho showed at the beginning about the geos geospace, you know. So I'm actually modeling on computer, just like you do the weather, um, what happens, I mean, between the sun and the earth, and the surface of the earth. So um, am I advancing this? Yeah, I can advance this, right? Not this one. Not this one. How do I advance? Oh, it doesn't take the keys. Oh, there it does. OK, so here's the history. So what I did uh, some, well, no, seven years ago is I figured that we all have a magnetometer in our pocket. Actually, the cell phones, they all have magnetometers built in. And I was just curious, I mean, how good they are, right? Whether what could actually do something with them. So what I did was to uh, buy a $20 or actually $10 cell phone, you know, a used cell phone charge it up, put it in my backyard, and there are apps that actually allow you to uh, record, I mean, all the sensors that are in there. And so what I found, you know, now I need to, I don't know, where is, where is it? Oh yeah, there we are. Okay, so what I found is, so the bottom, the bottom traces here are actually what the magnetometer recorded about a, over about two days or so. And there's this big spike here. There's something happening there. So then these uh, arbitrary coordinates, I mean, they're not even rotated. So this is just the magnitude. And then the lower one are the three different components that I was recording. And there was a lot of stuff happening. So uh, well, what happened? Maybe a deer walked by or so. But <laughs> it turned out when I then later compared that to solar wind data. So these are data for this is the velocity of the solar wind. Uh, this is the density of the solar wind, and this is the magnetic field Z component of the solar wind in the solar wind, the IMF. You see that this actually quite well correlates. You know, we have this initial shock wave in the solar wind, you know, which is also called the storm sudden commencement, you know, which immediately has an effect on the magnetic field on the ground, and then ultimately the activity is driven by the southward turning of the IMF, and you see all that stuff here. So now there. This is pretty noisy compared to what a typical ground magnetometer actually measures. And, but on the other hand, there are about 5 billion. That's what I figured back then. I mean, by today, it's probably more than 5 billion cell phones in the world. OK. And um, so the data are mostly useless, OK, because it's a very unstable platform, right? <laughs> you know, you walk around with this thing, you know. But once in a while, I mean, you also put it on, the, on a table, you know, and then you go to sleep, you know, and it will be more stable. But it's still difficult because there's all the magnetic fields of your surroundings, you know. I mean, you have the, someone talked about a washing machine, you know, that turns on and things like that, you know. You will record all this, you know. So there was the idea for a while, you know, why don't, don't, uh, don't we use the, all these uh, cell phones? There is actually a, uh, from NOAA has a, a thing that's called CrowdMac, and it's an app that you would have to install on your cell phone and will actually record it and send the data to them. But I don't think that's very useful. You, you would really need millions of those. I mean, not just a few hundred. I mean, that does, doesn't work. OK, but these sensors in there, you know, when you actually looked up the sensors that are in there, they're so-called magnetoresistive sensors, they cost about a dollar a piece. So they're really, really cheap. OK, and you can also buy little boards for Arduino, you know, or, or other. I mean, first of all, I also compared this with the magnetometers we have. And so these are the, the red curve is always the same. You see that? That's, that's what I measured, OK, in my backyard. The green and the black curves are from other magnetometers around the world. And I was looking for a magnetometer close to where I live in New Hampshire. And lo and behold, there is none. The next one is actually in Canada. It's in Ottawa. It's 600 kilometers away. So, and I will talk about that a little bit later. 
And so there are very few ones, but you see certainly the signatures are different at different places, but uh, they're all there, you know. So, I mean, we really caught the storm, you know. It was really a small storm. Okay, now the idea arose then of a cheap and useful ground magnetometer. So there's definitely a need for that. So the magnetometer data that are accumulated over the world, they're... Uh, most of them are now processed and made available through a website. I mean, that's called SuperMag. I mean, it's uh, run at Johns Hopkins University. Um, and so they have this map, you know, that actually shows you where these magnetometers are. And uh, you see there's, first of all, there's huge voids, you know. There's this huge void in, in Russia, you know. There, uh, also South America, Africa, they don't have very much. And of course, we have an ocean, you know. It's hard to place them, you know, so you have to be on an island. And uh, you have some higher concentrations in Europe, in the U.S. I mean, in Greenland, you have these chains, you know, up and down the south and east and west coast. And, but overall, it's actually pathetic. I mean, if you compare what we spent on, <laughs> on hardware in space, you know, I mean, just launched a few years ago a mission, I mean, uh, cost more than $1 billion, I mean, called MMS, you know, with four satellites, you know, and uh, so this is really pathetic. I mean, we should, could, should be doing much better. So there are typically about 200 magnetometers uh, worldwide that have data available, but sometimes it, it takes a year or two until you actually get the data. Uh, the ideal spacing, on the other hand, would be about 100 kilometers. And the reason for that is because what we are really sensing is mostly currents in the ionosphere, and the ionosphere is about 100 kilometers up, you know. So if you go closer together, you know, they pretty much see the same thing, you know. But if you go farther apart, you know, we're actually missing things, you know. So, but right now what we have is more on the, ch on the order of 1,000 kilometers or even much more, you know. You see that on that, on that uh, map. Uh, and when we have arrays, uh, they're mostly chains. I mean, if you look very carefully, there is a chain that's called the 210 meridian, you know, that goes from Australia all the way actually into Russia. Uh, there are a couple of chains or three or four chains in the U.S. You know, you see one in the middle here. You see an East Coast chain. You see Alaska chain. And also in Europe, they have some chains, you know. But they're, they're one-dimensional. We really would like to have that two-dimensional. Now. now, why is that? I mean, of course, these things cost money. You know, a typical station costs about 20 to 150 Ks to set up and to uh, about 1,000 or so to operate. And these are fairly high quality um, flux gates. You know, they're quite big, you know, about an inch and a half cubed, you know, and high hand wound and whatnot. Um, and then, of course, it's also expensive to actually place them, to deploy them, you know. If you actually have a station down in Antarctica or high up in uh, Canada, you know, I mean, you have to go out with snowmobiles or helicopters even to deploy them, you know, and that costs a whole lot of money. The typical stations that you have here, they have a sensitivity and noise level that's on, on the order of better than one nanotesla, okay. So they can do a lot of things. I mean, there is even two different types. I mean, ones are called mag magnetic observatories. Some of these have been around for 150 years, and they're really super calibrated and super stable over time. You know, they, they record things like what we call secular variations. I mean, slow variations of the, of the magnetic field that comes from the Earth's core, you know. And then there are the stations that are cheaper. Those are the variometers. That's the space weather stuff. They don't care. We don't care about slow variations or temperature stability. I mean, we care about variations that last minutes to days, you know. So but that's, that's really what we're after. Um, yeah, so, so many science applications have actually less stringent requirements, you know, and uh, when you look at the cell phone, you know, I mean, the cell phone was, was crappy, you know, compared to those stations, but we still got the storm, you know, we still got something useful out of that. Okay, so what are the requirements? So the idea is to build something that costs less than $1,000 to build and to test. Okay, uh, that basically means you have to use all off-the-shelf hardware. And that's for the complete station. I mean, that also includes, I mean, a solar panel and a battery and whatnot, you know. So they should be completely autonomous. No external power or communication requirements. Um, power is an issue that's not so difficult. We have good solar panels these days, you know. I mean, 50 years ago, that was a much bigger issue. Um, communication is also an issue. Uh, sometimes very expensive. I mean, many of these magnetometers that are actually in Canada or in remote places, they use satellite communications, which they have to pay for, you know. That takes a lot of power and also takes a lot of money. I mean, they use iridium most of the time. Um, they should be easy to set up and calibrate. So right now, most of the time, the way it works is, I mean, you, you calibrate your, your 
everything in the lab, you know, and then you have to bury the sensors, I mean, in the right orientation, all that, you know, so there's a different way to do that, and uh, we'll not go into the details, you know, so it should be possible for non-expert to actually get them into the ground, you know, and get them working. And there should be virtually zero operating costs, you know, as long as nothing goes wrong, you know, there should be very little operating costs. Now, sensitivity and cleanliness they have to be su sufficient for serious science, okay. So what do I mean with cleanliness? I mean, that's actually a term that comes from the satellite community. If you put a magnetometer on a satellite, the satellite has a lot of systems that have currents, right? I mean, the solar panels, you know, the transmitters, everything that's on the satellite produces currents. If your magnetometer is too close, you know, and there's no magnetic cleanliness, you know, I mean, you pick up all these signals from the satellite, you know, that totally swamps your other signal that you actually want to measure. Okay, so that is also true if you have a magnetometer on the ground. I mean, if, if you don't place it, I mean, in remote enough away from roads, from power lines, you know, from railroads and all that, you know, you'll pick up signals you don't want to pick up, you know, a lot of spurious signals. So that's what I mean by cleanliness. Okay, and the sensitivity should be enough. So what, we, what, do we, what are we after? I'll show you an example of a substorm. So it's not always storms. So also things are called substorm. There's ULF waves. Now be careful with the term ULF waves. I mean, the uh, science, our science community actually misuses that term. Where ULF waves, we really mean waves with periods between one and 30 minutes or so. So they're really, really low frequency. They're turning millihertz, not hertz or kilohertz, okay? So, but they're important. I mean, for example, the magnetic field lines of the Earth, of the magnetosphere, they can resonate, you know, and their resonance frequency, I mean, is, is a ULF wave, you know? You have these waves driven by the solar wind directly by Kelvin Helmholtz waves in the magnetosphere and whatnot. And there's a thing that's called the electrojet, I mean, which is basically the current systems, I mean, that flow above you, I mean, in the ionosphere at 100 something kilometers, you know, that's what we really want to measure. So that means when you translate that into a requirement of noise and sensitivity of about one nanotesla or less at about one minute resolution. I mean, that, that would give you something that is actually really useful for science, okay? So, so and you also want to have some sort of real-time data transmission, and that is today that's possible on, on cellular networks. I mean, pretty much within the US or Canada wherever, or Finland or wherever you place something, you know, you almost always have a cellular signal. And the data are not that many, you know. If you, if you transmit, I mean, one vector per minute, you know, I mean, that's, that's only a few kilobytes per day. Uh, power requirements these days can also be low. I mean, so you don't only lose a small solar panel and a lithium battery. Uh, they should be reliable, okay, so there's some trade-off between the number that you actually build and the reliability, you know, the more you build, if you lose 10 percent, you know, it's not that big a loss, you know, this is something really difficult to explain to NASA engineers who want to have everything perfect, okay. And one thing that's not important is temperature sensitivity, you know, you just bury the sensor in the ground and that's usually good enough. So. Here comes, I mean, we did a lot of experiments with these very small sensors that are in cell phones, and we found they're just a little bit too unreliable, and they're too, uh, too uh, noisy, and they're not good enough. I mean, even, I mean, we tried to have multiple sensors and averaging them and all that. So, and about a few years ago, Texas Instrument came out with a flux gate on a ship, okay? So the, the ship is actually this thing, you know? It's four millimeters square and it's a flux gate in there. I have no clue how they do that. I mean, it's, it's normally a flux gate has to be, has a certain thickness, you know, it has to have a core and all that. Of course, the trade-off for the size is that you have more noise. So officially, they give you 1.5 nano. Actually, they changed the documentation. I mean, a, a year ago, it was still, they, they claimed it was 1.5, one nano Tesla per, per square of Hertz. I mean, now it's 1.5. But that is actually quite reasonable, you know? I mean, and that is, so, so if you, go to a low frequency, a lower frequency than one hertz, you know, you actually get the no noise down. And um, now the chip itself is actually a surface mounted thing and also the chip itself uh, used to cost six dollars. I mean, it costs nine dollars now. I mean, chips are, <laughs> it's like gasoline, even worse, going up, you know. But the problem is, you know, they're surface mounted and it's, uh, unless you have special equipment, you cannot do that yourself, really, you know. Although, there are some YouTube videos that supposedly show you how, how you can mount a chip like that, you know, and, and solder it in, you know. I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't dare doing that. And so, so what you buy is actually this evaluation module, which also has some extra circuitry around it. So basically, it's four pins. 
means, nothing else. You know, it's ground, it's power in, it's a signal out, and it's a reference uh, voltage. You know, that's all you do. And it measures in one direction, so you need three of them. You know, so there's, there's a little arrow in there that tells you which direction it measures. So we built a prototype of that, you know, that this design is here. It's very simple, you know, you got a solar panel, you got a, got a $20 charge controller, uh, you got a lithium ion battery, that probably sets you back about 50 bucks or 100 bucks. Um, it's, since the sensor's output is actually analog, so you'd need a uh, I, uh, ADC, and um, well, we also want to have a, a, st a card storage. And as the microprocessor, what we have been using is a so-called particle, either the particle boron or the particle photon. Now, why they are so-called Internet of Things processors, IoT, so people put them into vending machines and, 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 and refrigerators and whatnot. Now, the, the, the boron is actually has a cell phone modem on it. Okay, so you can get the data out over cell phone or over over cell phone network. Uh, the photon has Wi-Fi. Okay, so uh, we started with the Wi-Fi, but then we found out. I mean, that's not good enough. I mean, it's probably better to go with the cellular. Now, it's actually not that expensive to to get the data out. That charge you three dollars per month. Uh, for three megabytes, you know, that's sufficient. I mean, we don't need more, okay? So then you put that all together. Um, now, since it's a magnetometer, you want to be away from all the other currents, you know, so we have the magnetometers actually in this little block here, I mean, just cast into resin. <laughs> so because we want to put them in the ground and want to keep the moisture out and everything, you know, we have a long cable about 10, 15 feet, you know, and that runs to a box, and the box is, well, this is an ammo box from Harbor Freight. <laughs> and uh, there we have a battery, there we have the rest of the electronics, um, the charge controller and all that, and then we have a solar panel. And so what can you do with it? So with a good friend from Canada, Martin Connors uh, from Athabasca, um, and the reason was what out there was, I mean, two reasons. A, I mean, he was very helpful. B, he has a good, good magnetometer right there. I mean, it's a station called ATH. And um, C, uh, in our neck of the woods, not so much is happening magnetically, you know. I mean, but if you are at higher latitudes, you know, you see what's called substorms. So these are two months of data. So forget, I mean, the top three panels are the three components. And uh, you see these, these excursions here. I mean, these are what's called substorms. I mean, storms happen maybe once a month or so when the sun is active. Substorms typically happen several a day. Okay, so now you don't have several a day on here because, of course, they are, you only really measure them in the night side, you know, near midnight, and so uh, you're not always there. So, but uh, there's a red curve and a green curve, and for the most part, you cannot see the difference. I mean, that, which basically means that our magnetometer is doing just as good, I mean, as, as, as his expensive magnetometer. Now, they're not exactly co-located. I mean, they're about a couple hundred meters apart. And uh, this station also was powered not by a solar panel, but, I mean, by, by real hooking up to the net, you know, and we also were using the photon and Wi-Fi data. But that doesn't really matter very much. But the runway is pretty stable. There's some differences, I mean, that still may have to do, I mean, with the way we actually calibrate and rotate the signals. Uh, and also with the fact that, uh, as Martin told me, they built a railway system near there, and which may also affect the data that we get. So direct comparison. So we got pretty good agreement. I mean, this down here, this is solar wind again. I mean, solar wind and IMF, so it's not really that, that helpful. So we figured, okay, so deployment can be expensive. If we do that ourselves, you know, we can probably add another thousand dollars to deployment. So what we would like to have is some sort of an array, I mean, in the Northeast. And uh, so we proposed to both NASA and NSF. Uh, I mean, to NASA, we said we would be deploying 20 stations to NSF 60. And so to build out some sort of a grid, and for the pro NSF proposal, we actually envisioned to ask you guys, ham radio operators, to assist us, to help us, to cite these things, you know. So unfortunately, both proposals were not funded. So we would try to like it, do it again. And so we know there's, I mean, and I didn't know the number. I know now that there are 700,000. Uh, am I out of time? Yeah, I'm out of time. Uh, 700,000 operators. So yeah, there should be enough, hopefully, to would be willing to help us. So there would be no cost to that. OK. So go through that very quickly. So I have a request. If you're interested, send us an email. 
what is required? Not much. I mean, it's it's basically that you live somewhere near the woods, you know, where you can put that, and uh, you're away from dwellings and power lines and all that. To spend, willing to spend about half a day to install and calibrate the thing. Uh, no monetary commitment. We would ship you the whole thing, including the the calibration device, which you ship back. Um, all stations get a unique identifier, so it will be your data in some sense. Uh, the data will be visible immediately because it goes real time, I mean, uh, to our servers. I mean, uh, there would be a website where you can see what everything is running and what your data look like. And uh, we would also, of course, make those data available to the scientific community. Okay. So thank you for your attention, and do you have any questions? <laughs>